Down on the valley, hopefully a fly fish to the day that I die. Spring has thawed out the long bitter winter. The water is clear and the skies are blue. I'm standing in the middle of the Beaver Kill River. Might even catch and release one or two. Well, some folks like horses, cats or dogs. Me, I like fishing with a rod and a fly. Yes, fishing is a favorite time of mine. If I couldn't do it, I think I would cry. Well, life is good when I'm wading a river. It gets even better when I cast a fly. If I catch a trout, it don't really matter. I'm Karen Goodman and I teach geology at BCC and this afternoon we're here to look at the stream at Wolf Park in the town of Shenango. We're going to see how the stream erodes its bed and we're going to look at some of the rock that we can find in the stream and see what it tells us about the history, the geologic history of this area. But before we head down into the stream We'll take a look at a couple of rocks we can see right here at the bridge. These rocks have been placed here to help form this little bridge, but a couple of them show some really interesting features. The first one here, if you look carefully, you can see some pieces of dark gray, almost black material that kind of looks like little plant stems. And in fact, that's what they are. They're uh, the carbon remains of plant material that grew in this area in kind of a swampy environment approximately 350 to 400 million years ago. And here we have them preserved in this rock. If we had a lot more plant and less rock, we would have a coal bed. The second rock we can see here, in this one, you can see these wavy ridges in the rock here. And these are ripple marks that were formed by water moving over the rock. Probably waves or currents right on the shoreline. Now that tells us that when the sediment forming this rock was being formed, again about 350 to 400 million years ago, this area was the edge of an ocean. It was an actual um, beach type environment. So we had waves and all sorts of ocean currents that could create these ripples in the soft sediment that was being deposited at that time. And now we'll head down into the stream. Well, we've just walked down the stream bank so that we're now in the stream bed itself. And we see lots of large pieces of rock lining the stream bed. These pieces of rock are part of the local bedrock. They've been uh, weathered out of the local bedrock. And there are basically two types of local rock, one of which we see in the, in the stream bed here. The first type is this type, very oh, maybe inch or two inch thick layer. Doesn't break very easily. It's composed of sand grains cemented together. So we would call this sandstone. It was, this rock is about 350 or 400 million years ago, years old. And it was deposited when our part of North America was at the edge of a shallow sea. So we're looking at rock that was deposited in a delta-like formation. Sometimes uh, the water, this would, area would have been a little underwater, sometimes a little above water. So we're getting um, rock that formed from sediment just like the Mississippi Delta. Now the other type of rock here is shale. 
and we'll see some of that later. But I want to, sh want to uh, show you some of the fossils that we can see in these rocks because the fossils are very important in telling us something about the environment of, of the area where, they, uh, where the rocks formed. Fossils are remains of, of previously living organisms. And in this rock, we can see lots of little indentations that are pretty badly weathered, but they look like some imprints of shells, sort of like seashells we can find today, but really a different organism. These would be shells of organisms we call brachiopods. They do have relatives living today, and these are definitely marine or saltwater creatures. They have a, an external shell shape, sort of like clams, two shells that open and close, but their, their um, bodies, their, their organs, their physiology is totally different. That's one kind of fossil. Second kind, which we see here, and we will, well, yeah. some little round, circular, disc like fossils are remnants of organisms called crinoids, which we often call sea lilies today. They're not plants, though, they're animals and they sort of look like plants because they have a long stalk-like component that's made up of little circular plates stacked one on top of another and then on top of that little stalk-like feature is the main body of the organism which kind of resembles in shape a tulip at least it does to me with tentacles on the end and the tentacles are what filter food out of the the sea um, those tentacles, they really aren't tentacles, they're f called feeding arms, but they resemble tentacles. That's where the main body of the animal is, and it's very difficult to find remnants of that part because when the organism dies, that part will be um, crunched up by predators getting at the main meaty body of the organism, whereas these little round flat plates don't contain anything that's worthwhile eating so they might, they would separate, fall to the seafloor, and make these little round impressions that we see in many of the rocks around here. Uh, these organisms uh, were pretty much stationary on the seafloor. They were anchored by a root-like um, feature, and they just got their nutrition by filtering out microscopic organisms from the ocean. They did not do photosynthesis, they were not plants, they just resemble plants in their gross uh, external shape. But they do tell us again that this area was part of a shallow sea because these organisms only live in shallow sea. Now there are some rocks here that aren't part of our local bedrock. Rocks that are much lighter in color, they've been smoothed and worn away a lot. Some rocks are reddish in color. These are what we call erratics. They did not form here in the local environment. They were transported long distances by glaciers. If we were standing here 20,000 years ago, this whole area would have been covered by a sheet of ice approximately oh, half to two-thirds of a mile thick and that ice would have originated up near where Hudson's Bay is now and as it moved outward it would have picked up a lot of rocks in between here and Hudson Bay and then when it melted and the ice melted back to the north and was the edge of the ice was in this area oh approximately 12,000 years ago 12 to 15,000 years ago it would have dumped a lot of sediment that it had in it so sometimes we find these odd-looking rocks, rocks that aren't the typical gray-brown layers of our own bedrock, and we know then that they don't belong here. They're erratics. Now we're going to focus our attention on the sides of the stream bed and on the activity of the stream itself. 
And one of the things we can find if we look really, really hard along the edge of the stream is clay. And this clay has some pebbles in it, but this clay is very special. It's very much like modeling clay. And it was deposited by glaciers as they moved through the area. And the weight of the glacier really compressed this clay this clay, and squeezed the, the little pebbles into it. And it's really quite a special clay. Um, it's what is often um, called glacial milk when it when water runs over it because when it's when it um, is carried in water it makes the water look very milky like and the pieces are so fine so very finely ground by glacial action that they form a suspension in the water almost like dissolving flour so the water gets a kind of milky flowery looking uh, appearance from having a lot of this glacial clay in it, sometimes called glacial flour, and the water being glacial milk sometimes. Now, the stream itself, although it's not very active right now, we can see lots of evidence of its activity. First of all, we can see here there are a lot of very large um, boulders, and when we look downstream, we'll see that they're much smaller. Now, these large boulders would be able to settle out even if the water were very active, but the smaller pieces would not be able to settle out in very turbulent, active water. So that's why we have this difference from right at this point where the water was quite active and further downstream, it was less active, it was quieter, it was moving a little more slowly, so the sm some of the smaller pieces could settle out. So we, we would use clues like that, the size of the boulders, to tell us something about the stream activity. The stream itself here is very young compared to the rock. The stream itself is only about 12,000 years old. It originated from the melting of the last ice sheet. And as we said, the last ice sheet was in this area somewhere between 12 and 15,000 years ago. So the stream is only a few thousand years old and it's been cutting down through this whole valley in that length of time. Not only has it been cutting down, but it's been cutting sideways into this stream bed. And you can see the undercutting that goes on here, exposing some roots from the, the trees growing on the bank, um, and eventually probably uh, forcing these, stream, these trees to fall over. We can see some huge rocks um, when we looked upstream, and we, those probably resulted from the stream undercutting them, where they were piled up against the, the um, culvert here, in or, and they, because of the undercutting, they fell over into the stream um, bed. So the stream has done all this activity in just a few thousand years. It's much more active in spring or after a storm when some of these pieces would actually be moved. A couple of other features you can see here in this area is a little bit of a raised flat area here, which is a little like a point bar where the stream goes, bends out, makes a big wide curve on the inside edge of that. You can have a point bar built up. Um, a little bit higher than that, even we see some small flat areas that could have marked the a previous level of the stream flow and then the stream has cut down through those. We could call those stream terraces. When we look downstream, we'll see a deposit of shale. And that shale is, is in place. It hasn't been weathered yet. It's still bedrock. And we'll see how nice and straight an edge that shale takes. That's very um, natural. That's not artificial. But that straight edge is an edge of a joint, a crack in the rock. And when the stream hits that, that it follows that straight edge and then it bends. And the stream, as do many of the streams in the southern part of New York and elsewhere, they have, they're influenced by these joints. They make these sharp bends as they hit one joint and then they'll bend and follow another joint. And we'll see that as we go on downstream. So as we go down from here, 
we're going to look more at the rocks. We're going to find more sandstones, more shales. We'll try to find more fossils. We'll see some other stream features and try to see how the stream is flowing down from this area here down to a waterfall, which will mark our last stop. It's much less strong, much weaker than the sandstone. Now this probably also has some sand particles in it, as well as some fine clay particles. But you can see the proportion of clay is much, much greater. Here we begin to see some bedrock actually in the stream bed itself. And the most prominent feature of these rocks are the square corners and the straight edges that are visible in, in these rocks. And these are edges of joints, cracks in the rock, natural cracks, which are due probably to pressures resulting from plate motions. We know that North America and Europe have come together and separated a couple of times at least during the lifetime of these rocks. And during the crunching or the stretching phase, the rocks would have cracked. And what we're seeing here is evidence of those cracks. And the cracks are almost at right angles. There are cracks going this way, you can see, and almost at right angles, another set going across it. One set of cracks goes down the stream in this area, one set goes across. And these are areas where water can seep in. We can have freeze-thaw action that pry the rocks apart. So that these rocks, when they, when they do come apart, they have nice straight edges and very square corners. And you can see some examples of these in the stream bed itself. Um, right. In rocks like this, nice straight edges, square corners. Here are some rocks that haven't quite separated. But again, you can see the, the straight edges and the sharp corners. The cracks go all the way across the stream, all the way down, sometimes more evident than others. They show up better in the sandstone rocks rather than the shales because the shales are so weak that the straight edges rather quickly get uh, modified and um, distorted and destroyed by the stream flow. The, the joints also provide nice um, areas where the water can develop little waterfalls, where we have these nice, uh, where the joints come together and a big piece has been eroded out, you can have little waterfalls forming. And those are places where the water will actually erode the rock farther and farther upstream. Here's another one. There's one in where you can see a red, about a three inch fall up there. Here's another place where this joint has been actually widened by the water flow. So joints really do concentrate the water flow. And the joints will also make the water make the, make the stream take these sudden sharp angled bends. Even though they're quite small here, they are actually evident. This, the water's flowing this way, then it will bend, flow this way. Downstream, we'll see there's another nice straight rock wall that forces the stream to flow parallel to it. The same kind of action occurs in many streams in, the, in this part of the state. Uh, many of the state parks near Ithaca, Tagenic Falls, uh, Robert Treeman State Park, Buttermilk Falls, even Watkins Glen. You can see the same effect of the joints causing just the stream to take these sharp bends. One other thing we can see here is a little bit of rounding action by the stream. We can see these kind of rounded features, especially in the shale, which is less resistant. The stream has a nice rounding effect. Right um, ahead of us, we can also see a nice little uh, plunge pool or pothole. It's hard to tell the difference, but a little deeper pool 
where the water eddies around and erodes the bottom in a circular fashion, or there might have been a little waterfall here that created a pool um, in that area. Also typical of streams of this type. Now what we can see here is this nice long edge here. Again, the edge of a joint. The stream is actually widening the joint into a V here. And uh, if we get a close enough look, we can see some joints cutting across the stream. So these joints are just throughout the, they're throughout the rock of this whole part of New York State. West of the Hudson River, south of the Adirondacks, we will find joints in practically all the rock. Another interesting thing we can see here is the trees make these nice, beautiful curves. Those curves tell us that the soil the trees are anchored in is moving. The soil is moving down slope or creeping and the tr it will force the trees to lean outward but then the trees since they're living will grow toward the sunlight which is straight up and so they develop these these curves and we can see that quite a few places along these hillsides and you can see them practically anywhere. There's a, a nice steep hillside because the soil will be creeping quite rapidly. So we're going to work our way downstream and uh, find some other interesting features until we finally get to the waterfall. So we're looking at some shale and some sandstones here. And we can see down at the base of the stream bank that there's a lot of shale, and the shale has eroded in farther, and lots of little pieces uh, have resulted from the weathering of the shale, whereas the sandstone is more resistant and it tends to stick out more. And when it does weather, it forms bigger pieces that drop off into the stream bed. And this is very typical of the difference between more sandy more resistant deposits and shaley deposits with lots of weak clay. Here we can see some more crinoids that we saw earlier, only this time there's some shell material still present. And we can tell that by testing it with hydrochloric acid and we can see the fizzing that results when acid dissolves calcite. So these crinoid creatures had an external shell composed of calcite. And there's still some of that in several places in this rock. The calcite actually may not be the original shell material. It may be shell material. It may be calcite that deposited after the original shell material dissolved away. This very, very lovely fossil is a crinoid. Only now we're seeing a whole series of those little round flat plates that make up the crinoid, the, the stalk-like part of the crinoid, and we're seeing them lying on their side. And you can see how the cross-section of these plates is shown. This did not come apart when the crinoid died. Um, so you can get an idea of how tall these things were. These would have been standing upright on the sea floor. As we follow this up, it looks like right at this point, this might have been the start of the calyx, or the main body of the crinoid, but I can't find any other part of it that's really obvious, but this part certainly looks bigger and that could be the main body part where it's down here would be where it was anchored in the sea floor. That's a really beautiful example of a long segment uh, of a crinoid.
here we're standing at the top of the highest waterfall on this stream. It's maybe 20 feet high. And it's the end point of our little field trip here. The waterfall here is a typical waterfall in that there's a hard rock, the sandstone, sitting right on the top. Called the, it's called the cap rock here. But underneath it is shale. And as the water flows over the waterfall, it erodes the shale quite easily and undercuts the sandstone on top. The, the sandstone will eventually erode because along the joints, and you can see some nice sharp corners here showing you where the joints are, water will seep in along the joints and in between the layers and, and freeze thaw action will eventually pry these um, layers apart and will make very uh, large square, square rectangular pieces that will fall off. But the shale eroding constantly underneath is what removes the support, allowing these um, sandstone pieces to eventually fall off. So eventually this waterfall will move back upstream by all the while undercutting and then having the top cap rock fall off in large pieces. Now one other thing we should think about here is our trip down, down the stream has not only covered distance but covered time. Geologists view sedimentary rocks as recorders of time. And the rock that we're standing on here is lower than the rock where we started. When these, these sediments were deposited, they would have been continuous. That is, the rocks where we started would have formed layers over top of these, and there would have been a continuous sequence of layers. Erosion has removed the overlying layers in this spot point so we can see down to lower layers. Well, these layers had to be deposited first. According to the principle of superposition, the lower layers came first and therefore they record earlier times. So if we were expert at analyzing these rocks, the fossils and the other characteristics, we could tell what the conditions were when these sediments were deposited and we could keep going back upstream to higher and higher layers and we could write a little history of the changes that would have occurred in the environment here just by analyzing the evidence of those changes in the rock layers.